All right. Um, and as I just asked um, you, can you just confirm that you hear me well? Um, just through the chat window, just say, okay, connection is good, please. I just like to make sure that I'm uh, audible. Okay, perfect. I hear Eric confirmed that. Thank you, Eric. Um, and we, um, great. Thank you, Ben. Um, today we will have a, um, a Ben that's, that's a familiar face. Good to see you. Um, would be great to catch up. And while more participants are coming in, I'm, I'm giving you all talking privileges so that we can do a Q&A if possible. You can also post your questions through the uh, Q&A uh, box on your um, screen or through the chat box, that's also possible. And um, I would like to uh, get started with the uh, webinar in a, in a minute or so. Let me wait for one more moment until more participants join. Huh? Um, yeah, there is a webinar. And uh, if you can keep yourself in mute, please, that would be great. So welcome. As I already stated, my name is Willem Boots. I'm very happy, delighted to um, be able to conduct this webinar, which we um, were planning to have uh, before the weekend, uh, but we had some um, technical issues um, that uh, didn't allow us to move forward. So that's why I'm very happy to, um, to have you here today on Monday. It's in the US, it's uh, Memorial Day, which is an important day. And um, I hope you are all doing well in uh, wherever you are in the world of uh, coffee. I'm going to um, open up my presentation. Seconds. Almost there. I'm just getting my screen lined up here. Okay, um, so you should be looking now at my screen, um, the first slide that says Gießen webinar, roasting lights consistently. That's the theme of um, this webinar. And um, I assume you can all see this screen well. And so, so why did we choose this topic, roasting light consistently? Um, because since a number of years, um, uh, light roasts have become uh, kind of a popular approach for roasters not just in the US, but uh, around the world. And um, we also noticed that um, there are um, roasters who, who sometimes struggle with light roasts. And um, I want to specifically address some of those um, challenges by really reviewing some, uh, some steps and procedures how to uh, perform uh, light roasts um, not only consistently, but also to be able to roast coffee's light uh, in a way that the coffee shows a distinct flavor profile, a distinct identity. In, the, uh, in my own personal career, in my, in my own personal um, history in coffee, I grew up in the, in the Netherlands where traditionally roasts have been, roasting colors have been um, light. Um, we would only 
think of going into second crack in case um, it was for a darker espresso roast, more of a Southern Italian style. But in the Netherlands, traditionally, similar like in Germany um, and Belgium, roasting colors have been light. We've seen um, since the um, early start of specialty coffee, I would say with the second wave of coffee and the second wave of specialty coffee, we've seen um, that ro roasting colors started to become very dark. Um, that this was in the um, uh, birth of uh, companies like um, Pete's Coffee and Starbucks in their early um, rise. And we've seen that uh, companies that followed, followed after that from the 1990s and on, we <laughs> saw that dark roasts did become kind of a, a, a hallmark feature of the second wave of specialty coffee. Then in the third wave of specialty coffee and with roasters who um, are um, operating nowadays, we see that um, uh, roasting colors have become lighter. And um, around the year, I would say 2010, if I was uh, observing um, the approach in San Francisco, we saw that roasting colors really started to get very light. And this has to some degree remained, although we still see in the United States where specialty coffee is a major um, trend, a major um, channel for coffee, we still see that a significant percentage of um, coffees out there that um, have the uh, pretension to be specialty, that those coffees are still roasted quite dark. But we do see, fortunately, that um, plenty of roasting companies have uh, been uh, shifting to significantly lighter roasts. And so when we're talking about um, um, light roasts, we can also uh, specifically discuss some of the, the mishaps that um, can occur when roasting light. And specifically, I want to just um, highlight some of these uh, mishaps, some of these um, failures to roast light successfully. And here are some, some examples. Um, and these are some examples that I just take from, from my own lab. Our lab is located um, it, it, north of San Francisco. And also what we have been copying from clients. And here are some some examples, um, like a pulped natural Brazil um, that can, you know, can have distinct attributes driven by a lot of sweetness, um, sweetness of cantaloupe and hazelnuts. Um, you know, in the case of light roasts not um, going well, then specifically if those coffees are prepared espresso, you know, uh, peanut flavors and malty flavors can develop as a result of um, under roasting, which is not necessarily um, a flavor that um, is pleasing. Or in the case of um, uh, like a prolific coffee type, like a Kenyan SL28, um, a washed coffee, instead of the acidity featuring um, sweetness, it can be yeah, undesirably sour, as if you're, you're tasting the um, sourness of an, uh, an unripe, kind of a green tomato. Or in the case of um, um, a well-known coffee, very popular in um, specialty, um, Sumatra coffees, for example, the traditional processed, the so-called uh, wet pulped Sumatras, um, Sumatra mandaling, for example, can also have very distinct malty flavors, uh, earthy flavors when roasted too light. S Sumatra is, for example, um, an example of a coffee that has been traditionally used in the US um, by those roasters 
that um, like to uh, feature very dark roasts, but if those coffees are under roasted, they can be very um, undesirable. And then uh, in this example, last but not least, um, if you have, for example, a um, Panama Geisha, a washed Panama Geisha, this is um, a coffee category I'm very familiar with because we produce those coffees in Panama. Uh, when roasted too light, when under roasted, they can taste um, somewhat bland, somewhat neutral, and the body can become very um, thin, as if the coffee just lacks body. Um, and that can be um, a major deception because typically roasters, they pay um, consistent or specific premiums for these coffees. And then you, of course, expect these coffees to feature um, distinct, um, not only sweetness, but also uh, you would be looking for um, also uh, the aroma to be floral. And um, so let's talk about some ways how we can, can um, prevent this. First, I want to review with you um, some of the uh, steps that lead to the development of the coffee from green bean to first crack so that we are very clear about the pathway of the coffee from green to the first crack to becoming a roasted bean. So let's look at some, um, some significant steps. So first, you know, when we are talking about roasting from a um, chemistry perspective, we are of course looking at um, uh, three distinct steps. The, from green, we, we would first enter into the drying phase. The drying phase is the, is the phase that um, is required to allow the coffee bean to lose a significant part of its moisture. And during this phase, um, towards the end of this phase, you really start smelling kind of the wet grass, freshly cut grass type of uh, aromas. Uh, then the next phase following into this is the Meillard phase. The Meillard phase, what is it? Um, Meillard was a French chemist who first described these um, uh, reactions occurring not only in uh, roasting coffee, but also in the um, baking of bread. And you can find Meillard reactions in the preparation of uh, the baking of pizzas, for example. Uh, so this Meillard phase is then followed by the caramelization phase, which is the phase where we typically also talk about um, the um, development phase of the coffee, specifically from the start of the first crack. And so I think whenever you're going to um, plot lighter roast profiles, it's very important to allow um, sufficient opportunities to also recognize these distinct phases and to take time either with your um, roast profiler, you might be using a, a Gießen profiler or you might be using offer other types of software for this. Um, I like the Gießen profiler because it's, um, it's user-friendly. It has a, gives a good customer experience, user experience. But of course you can also, you can also of course look at other profilers that are out there in the market. Was there a question from someone? No, okay. Um, so. Ik zou nog vragen voor jou, dan gaan mensen verwachtingen krijgen. Uh, could you put yourself in mute, please? Thank you. So let's first look at, you know, what is the, um, what are from a bean perspective? So what can we look at um, yeah. when we, when we study the beans? What, we, what can we look at? Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to. Ik doe het in ieder geval denk ik nog niet op mijn bean 17. Uh, nee, zou je misschien nee, jezelf op mute kunnen zetten? Want uh, ik hoor je, je ja. in mijn kanaal hier. Please. Um, so we of course start here with the 
green bean. This is an example of a washed green bean. Um, and so when we look at the distinct development of this bean, so when we are in the drying phase, um, you, can, you can basically say that upon moment of charging the beans into your roaster um, during the first 60 to 90 seconds, um, the beans are getting accustomed to the, uh, the heated environment of the roasting drum. There's a moment where we um, see the um, beans taking up heat at this, from this moment on, when we are through this uh, point, that's when we really start losing moisture. And specifically, there is this point where you get into uh, uh, the temperature level of 100 degrees C or 212 degrees Fahrenheit, where water starts boiling and the uh, moisture inside green beans can be uh, as high as uh, um, the maximum allowable moisture would be 12% in order for the coffee to be qualified as a specialty. So the drying phase really starts at the point that the temperature, the bean temperature starts exceeding 100 degrees C or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And here you can see a visual of a bean in S phase or one step further when we are getting towards the end of the drying phase, um, the bean can look like this. You can see on this specific bean, that there is already some, some expansion going on. Um, and that's basically because the um, evaporating moisture of the coffee starts putting pressure on the overall um, cell structure of the coffee which leads to expansion. And you can also see on this specific bean uh, that the Maillard reactions are already starting to happen, which causes also a first browning of the coffee beans being roasted. And if you look at a um, um, cross cut of this same bean, you can see this color change happening as well, as in this picture. Um, and then when the Maillard reactions are in full swing, beans start also now picking up significant color. Um, we are still not that close to the first crack yet, but we're getting closer. And now we're getting close to the development phase. Now caramelization is starting to happening. And um, in this development phase, we of course want to be very alert on the um, development in color and in aroma and bean temperature, because now we're getting close to the point where we need to decide whether or not to call it a roast, to finish the roast. And um, I think, you know, with the emergence of uh, all kinds of uh, time temperature profilers. Um, it's, I think it's important not to just always keep your eyes on these uh, digital profilers, but also to develop the aptitude mm -hmm. to recognize uh, in what phase these beans are when you're making visual assessments of these coffee beans. I feel that that is very essential because specifically when you are preparing, when you're developing your profiles for your light roasts, it's really important to always have a benchmark of what the beans of the coffee uh, looks like and what um, aromas can be smelled at that point through your trier. For those of you who are um, working with um, uh, Actron color scale, which nowadays has become more of the SCA color scale. The bean that we're looking at here is um, measured at 66 to 68 on the actual scale. Um, and if I would grind this bean, it would uh, give me most likely a number that is in the uh, low 70s. And that is called the, the delta that we can find in the uh, 
um, in the roasted coffee. Um, and now, if we very specifically look at you know what um, sensory milestones we can um, identify when we're specifically now again going through this process of coffee going from green to roasted, then again, as a reference, um, this coffee Fahrenheit 272 degrees. If you, if you want to convert this to Celsius uh, or to centigrade, I just recommend you uh, do that online. It's very easy to do that. So here we are still in the drying phase, freshly cut grass can be smelled now very distinct smell, specifically with uh, washed coffees. Now we are at 300 degrees, in this case at four minutes, 30 seconds, um, the smell of hay. At this point, the Maillard reactions are really in uh, full swing. Uh, and then we continue into the roast. Now we're going through the, um, the Maillard reactions into caramelization. We're now at 354 degrees, in this case, at seven minutes 50. Um, at this point, we're close to the first crack where there is a short, uh, kind of a short instance where the coffee releases briefly some aromatics. These aromatics are being released as a result of the pressure building up in the coffee bean because of the water vapor uh, creating a lot of pressure. And this water vapor starts to, uh, combined with the heat, starts to uh, push out oils contained in the coffee, which uh, become gases and which become so uh, prolific uh, for yeah, what we recognize now as the early precursors for the um, uh, aromatics of the coffee being roasted. The, on the right side, you can see the beans at 365 degrees at nine minutes, just before the first crack. And um, now we are almost at the end of the first crack. And now the roast is finished in this example at 10 minutes, 35 seconds. So that's, you know, I would say this is an example of a, um, um, a light roast that has been done um, precariously with enough control so that the um, uh, roaster, the roast master, can very gradually identify these phases also. And so I think uh, doing a light roast successfully and being able to always being in touch with the um, chemistry developments within the beans, it's very important that this light roast can be done with a sufficient amount of control. And I feel that the most um, uh, common mistakes done for light roasts is that the roaster uh, is trying to accomplish this roast in too little time. And specifically, when you're doing light roasts too quickly, you're exposing yourself to the risk of um, um, under roasting the coffee and to not allow sufficient time for these distinct, for these important phases that are part of the chemistry of the coffee. Um, and then feel free to send me over some questions if uh, they come up. Let me see if there are any in the chat window already. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite interested to hear from you guys, you know, in the different parts of the world where you are. I'm quite interested to hear, you know, what, what are some of the challenges that you, in your uh, environment encounter with roasting lights and specifically what are some of the challenges that you encounter with the consistency of this. So please feel free to take advantage of uh, my presence here. Um, 
And here's, a, here's an example. Uh, here's a question from Dick. Um, what is the difference between slow and fast roast other than time? So, um, you know, obviously the um, slow and fast roast in order to accomplish a slower roast, you need, you'll, you'll need to very specifically control your burner output. And depending on the machine that you use, but let's say, let's assume you're using a Gießen, then with your Gießen, you have this second parameter of um, controlling your roast profile. And that is through your PA setting, your, basically your airflow setting. If you're uh, increasing your PA, so more air throughput through the drum, with a relatively higher temperature, then you will, of course, accelerate your roast very consistently and significantly. Um, there's a third parameter with the Gießen that you can use to also uh, accelerate or slow down your roast profile. And, and that's through the use of the RPMs, the, the rotation per minute of your drum. Um, typically, um, the um, Gießen machines are shipped at a um, setting of around 55, where it comes to the RPMs, that corresponds, that's actually the hertz setting for the motor that makes the drum rotate, that corresponds with about um, 50, between 55 to 59 revolutions per minute. So if you slow down your um, rotation speed of your drum, the beans will also tend to develop slower. There will be more uh, conductive heat, but less convection heat, which tends to make the roast go um, faster, convection heat. Um, uh, specifically, uh, one other final parameter that you can identify where it comes to uh, controlling the speed of your roast can also lie in your batch charge. So if you charge your um, drum, not at 100%, but let's say at 50%, which I know many of you do because you might do this with um, uh, more exotic coffees, then you will also find that it's much easier to roast such coffees too fast because you have too much heat for the bean mass in your drum. So I hope that that answers this a little bit. Um, there's a question from Fallon. I missed what an A point means at 354. Can you clarify? So there is um, right before the first crack there is um, a moment where the beans are briefly releasing the aromatics that are being, um, uh, that are locked up in the cellular structure of the coffee. These aromatics, the A stands for aromatics, these aromatics are created because of a combination of uh, high temperature, pressure buildup, by the water vapors um, that are the result of the residual moisture. And these uh, conditions start to create changes with the oils inside the beans. And these oils are specifically the um, present uh, materials that will produce these aromatics. So you can, for a brief moment before the first crack starts, when you're using your trier, you can actually smell these first precursors of the aromatics of the coffee. And that's the A point. Uh, three, the number 354 was the, um, um, for the sake of the photos that we use, that was the temperature at which we smelled these aromas first. But I must clarify here, when I'm doing this on, my Gießen W6 versus on my Gießen W1A, then these temperatures can be slightly different. If you're using 
a different roasting machine altogether, then also um, the temperature readout of your thermocouple can be different simply because um, the thermocouple is from a different make or um, because it's placed at a different position in your uh, machine. So these temperatures don't take them absolute. Typically, the A point occurs um, about 10 degrees Fahrenheit before the first crack starts. That's what I found. Um, then there's a question from um, Ryan. What would be the best way to limit end temperature and development time? Are they working independently or together? Would holding an end temperature steady but increased development time be a positive thing? So basically, you know, um, now we have to, of course, ask ourselves, which end temperature are we talking about? So this is the bean temperature, I assume. Um, the longer I prolong my roast, typically, um, if I'm not stalling, if I'm not baking, then uh, I'm allowing the development time to continue. The temperature, end temperature, will be pushed out further. But I can, of course, slow down my uh, roast development, and I can specifically look at that through my rate of rise. So if my rate of rise is quite low, and I'm saying low between two degrees at the lowest to um, 20 degrees Fahrenheit at the highest, but if it's quite low, then I can continue my development time without seeing a major increase in end temperature. So those kind of go hand in hand. However, the danger here is, and I'm getting into uh, some examples for this soon, the, the risk here is when your rate of rise, which is the temperature at which the beans temperature increases, if the rate of rise is very low, then you're running the risk that you're starting to bake, that you're stalling your roast that you're losing important um, flavor notes. So you have to be careful uh, there. So the question is, you know, can the increase of the development time be a positive thing? You know, it can be positive as long as you can control your rate of rise sufficiently. If your rate of rise is too high, then um, an increased development time will mostly, under most conditions, result into beans that are just roasted quite darker. But if your rate of rise is low, then I can extend my development time without necessarily over roasting the coffee. Um, and then there is a, uh, another question by Dick. Please explain about the between batch protocol when using the Gießen. Um, and I think you're referring to, you know, what can I do with my Gießen um, if I'm between batches in order to maintain my thermal mass, in order to maintain my, um, the heat locked into the machine. I assume that's what you're referring to. Um, my advice here is that when you're uh, going from one batch to the next, um, and um, I always recommend to be able to continue roasting in a um, fluid manner, meaning you will want to line up your next batch when your previous batch is being um, finished. But let's say there is a two minutes, three minutes in between, because you also might want to um, allow the beans to cool sufficiently. So what I suggest rather than allowing the roasting machine to lose its thermal mass with the flames totally off, uh, one suggestion can be to um, keep your burner at the minimum setting. You can do this by basically um, setting your burners at 1%. Uh, 
And in this case, you're allowing the thermal mass to maintain in the machine. In addition to that, um, but it, there's a risk in this, and I'll explain that. Another way to approach this as well is that you bring your PA, your air pressure, way down so that there is less air throughput, which also will risk less that your um, machine will start cooling down too much. The risk here is that if you do that, that you're um, forgetting about the PA being at such a low setting so that you wouldn't be able to, uh, so that you forget to set the PA at its normal default setting. That's the risk. So um, you will have to um, remind yourself to put the PA in the original position. Uh, the lowest setting on the PA on the GISA is typically is 80. That's 80 Pascal of pressure. And um, in our lab, when we're doing um, roast profile development, we're using typically as a default value 120 so that we can always increase and always decrease where needed. And I hope that helps. So again, between batches, it's really key to um, um, make sure that you maintain the thermal mass contained in your machine. Um, one final comment on that is also when you start your roast, um, you can always expect that your first batch and sometimes your first two, maybe sometimes your first three batches are not going to deliver the flavor profiles that you're looking for. So my suggestion here is to take um, sufficient time to preheat your roasting machine and also um, not to immediately start with you know your signature coffees um, in your first roasts, but possibly first start with um, uh, coffees that might not be your your top grade coffees, but coffees that are a little bit more forgiving. So I hope that uh, that helps in terms of your questions. Ah, um, thank you uh, for your um, comments. Uh, um, separate. I, I don't know how to pronounce your name. My Russian is um, non-existing, so I'm um, uh, not sure how to pronounce your name. But thank you for your for your comments and for your compliments. So let's let me go on um, with some. Uh, and you asked also what is point A? Point A again is the point at which you first smell the very first aromatics of the coffee right before the first crack. Um, great, I'm going to share my screen again. So now let's specifically look at, you know, when we are, um, I hear a dog barking. If you could put yourself on mute, please. Thank you. Um, um, so how do we create these roasting profiles if we're strategizing for light roast profiles? First and for all, it's really important to uh, know how to um, define and how to calculate the development time. And um, so development time is, of course, the time for the first crack to the end of the roast. I think most of us, we know that. And it's a percentage of the time from the first crack of the, to the end of the roast. And so there's always a traditional challenge in development time um, is that, you know, the challenge is, you know, when does the first crack really start? Um, and I've uh, seen roasters struggle with that because, you know, your roaster machine can be in a noisy environment, uh, which is quite normal in the, in this case of roasteries, um, or it might just be hard to hear the first crack, and that could also be a coffee issue that um, some beans just have very soft cracks more than other beans specifically beans with a um, 
like a lower density, they often tend to have a very subtle first crack. So what one thing is true is that coffees across the board on one and the same machine with the same moisture, they will typically show a first crack at a very specific temperature, um, depending on you know where your machine is, what air pressure that typically is. And um, so you can gauge with coffees that have loud first cracks, you can kind of gauge what your end temperature is with these coffees with a loud first crack so that you can also then reason that coffees that are softer that do not have such an audible first crack. So you can argue then, you know, at this temperature, it is very likely for the first crack to occur. But let's assume you can hear your first crack and you can identify it. That then allows you um, quite easily to, to determine the development time. And of course, the development phase is quite critical to the, the end flavor because um, the specific characteristic notes of the coffee, um, whatever type you're using, are determined by the length of this development time. And um, I often get the uh, question, you know, how do I um, calculate the percentage of the development time? It's, it's basically the time from the first crack to the end of the rose. We already knew this. So if I have a first crack at 10 minutes, 35 seconds, and an end of a rose at 12.45, then my development time is two minutes, 10 seconds. And here on this slide, we actually show you how to calculate this. It's a fairly easy calculation as I have displayed here. I'm going to use some examples also pretty soon. Um, and again, it's uh, quite critical that you allow yourself to um, uh, calculate this development time sufficiently and also that you can actually hear when your first crack occurs. Yeah, for example, like if you are located in Siberia, then your winters will be cold, probably freezing, uh, your summers will be hot. And so take into account that um, the coffee beans also change with your weather cycles. And that as a result of that, um, a lot of parameters can change. So when you are in these extreme climates where you have hot summers, cold winters, um, your coffees can change with that. And that's uh, something to take into account. Here's another example of um, uh, a development time and percentage calculation. Um, resulting in a 16.9% calculation. And I, I trust that that's clear to you. Um, if you're using um, the geese and roast profiler, you can actually um, tell your machine at which points typically the first crack starts in the settings panel. You can also uh, then determine these same parameters for the Maillard reaction, as well as for the drying phase. And then your software will automatically calculate um, the times and the percentages for each of these phases. However, I always recommend that you're able to uh, calculate this yourself. Don't rely on your software to do it all for you because there will be times when your software fails and you're basically not able to um, do it automatically. I just want to briefly review um, a um, roast profile that we did for this purpose. And I'm going to um, do a more rapid uh, uh, replay. But you can see here on the Gieson Profiler software that we created uh, a previous roast, which became kind of the, the benchmark for this, for this specific coffee. And um, we're now going to try to recreate this 
um, by doing another roast as example. And now we're going through the turning points, which is the turning point is the point at which the beads start to absorb heat. The um, red curve is the bean temperature curve. The blue curve is the air temperature curve. And now the bean temperature curve starts to increase again. Now the bean starts to um, absorb heat. If you look on the left side, you see the temperatures in Fahrenheit. And look at what happens now. We can see the rate of rise also peaking. So this is the rate at which the bean temperature increases per 30 seconds. Gets up quite high in this case. And now we gradually move through the drying phase. Two minutes, 30 seconds, two minutes, 40, 50. And um, now we're moving into the Maillard reactions. And um, there's a little twitch in the rate of rise curve that probably because the operator was um, taking a sample at that point, or it's just a little distortion of the signal to the from the um, thermocouple to the controller. And you can see in this case, how the rate of rise was taking a very gradual downward slope and how also the bean temperature and the air temperature get closer to one another. So, and now we are here, you can see we start the development phase now. You can see when you're looking, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm circling around the area where that information is displayed. So we had a drying phase of 51% and a yard phase of 42%. And now we are getting into the development phase that is now in motion. And we're getting now close to the end of the roast, which is now finished. And this roast was done in um, about 11 minutes. So, you know, regardless whether you're doing a, a darker roast or a light roast, you will always want to make sure that you can control your process gradually, that you have always the determination in which phase of chemistry development the coffee is. So, and I think that's really key here. When you want to do light roasts consistently, you've got to be able to um, follow through, focus on the chemistry development. Uh, before I'm going on again, let me take some more questions. Um, Sergey, thank you. Now I know how to pronounce it. Why the rate of rise collapses before the first crack? So the rate of rise comes down leading to the first crack on purpose because the roast roaster operator will ensure that there is less heat input, relatively speaking, into the coffee. Because if not, if you would keep your burner full on in an extreme crazy case, um, you would see that you get um, uh, pyrolysis, which is basically a process where the coffee starts to generate its own heat to the degree that it will create a fire. And so the rate of rise has to collapse. It has to come down before the first crack, because if not, I would um, not allow the coffee sufficient development time, or I would over roast the coffee, or I would burn the coffee. So it's a it's an absolute requirement that my rate of rise comes down. And that's as a result of the fact that I'm also allowing my burners, my burner output to come down gradually. What's my, um, and then Sergey asks, you know, what's your recommendations for development percentage for African coffees? You know, Africa is huge, it's a huge continent. There are oof, so many coffee producing countries 
uh, if I would say on, on the Eastern African side, uh, we have Ethiopia being the most uh, prolific African country, African producer. Um, um, if I would say, you know, an across the board uh, recommendation where it comes to Ethiopian washed coffees um, from prolific areas like um, uh, Guji, Yirga Chefi, then, you know, my recommendation would be to never roast those coffees, of course, too dark, but to allow development percentages between 12 to 18 percent max but you know i would if you would ask me the same question for latin america i would give you the same answer so my answer doesn't help you too much i'm afraid it's more that you will have to recognize that each coffee from each region in the country from each um, elevation altitude in a specific country will uh, require its own very specific approach. And the only way in which we can determine what the ideal development percentage is, is by cupping, is by doing your cupping um, very diligently. And that's what I want to get into now also to make some um, recommendations there. Um, let me close some windows here. Man, time moves always too fast in these webinars, but you should be aware that we offer other opportunities through webinars as well. Um, so let me go back. Okay, so let's talk about some roasting profiles um, using different approaches for light roasts and what kind of flavor attributes can be found. So for, for this purpose, we, we selected a coffee from uh, Cauca in Colombia, which is a very prolific region from our um, Coffee for Peace program. And this was, you know, this was not really done with the purpose to give you one single recipe for such a coffee, but what I really want to do the, here is to um, present you some different light roast scenarios. Um, and um, so this is my first scenario. And this is from trials we actually did in our, uh, in our lab, right? Um, you can see the flavor wheel, which is uh, thanks to our friends from uh, Tastify, which is um, um, a uh, type of software to be able to um, display the flavor profile of coffees. Um, and you can see here with a, this first example of a light roast, what flavors were found. And these were two cuppers, Q graders in our lab that did this cupping. And you can see the roasting time in this first light roast was eight minutes, 30 seconds. I see a lot of roasters nowadays um, doing these faster roasts and there is an inherent um, risk in doing this because again, you, you want to be consistent. So you will want to um, uh, be consistent in color, in bean color, and also to some degree in um, bean temperature. Like in this first example, a drying phase was, uh, maintained of two minutes, 55 seconds. And then the Maillard reactions, um, three minutes, 20 seconds. At that point, the bean temperature was now close to 365 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, the development took two minutes, 50 seconds, 15 seconds, which was done for the purpose of allowing still enough development on the coffee. And that was done because the coffee, uh, this batch kind of raced. It went very fast towards this first crack. It was there at six minutes, 15 seconds. The flames were cut to the absolute minimum in order to allow for a longer development 
in order to get to that desired bean color. So you can see the development phase is 26%. And you can see what was going on is that it was not baking because we still had a um, positive rate of rice, but the coffee was roasting, developing very slowly. And that created these, uh, according to one copper, kind of these grain cereal notes, um, kind of these fresh wood notes. Uh, there was still some florality and some sweetness, um, even some florality like in roses. But on the other side, the coffee really had um, notes that also led to, to some uh, astringency, some drying uh, aspects in the cup. And so this was a light roast that was not a success. I've had from various brands and roasters in the US, I've, I've tasted examples of this where a lot of um, flavor potential of the coffee is uh, unused, it's not being, um, being um, um, applied. Second example, light roast number two, same coffee, also a Cauca Colombia coffee. Um, so here things were, um, uh, the roasting time was still relatively fast, but now the development time was shortened in order to not repeat the previous, um, flavor profile. Um, and the development time was shortened. How? By allowing for a slightly higher rate of rise. And now, you know, there was a lot more complexity in the cup. There was now citrus and tangerine and some roses, uh, according to the, the coppers. Uh, but there still was some grains and cereal notes, some rye notes. Um, so there was improvement, but it was still not what we were looking for. Um, and so you can see um, how important it is to do uh, cupping diligently, right? And then in the third example, now we were able to, um, to nail this roast and that made a huge difference. Now the flavors were really those that we were hoping for. Uh, again, this was a Colombian Cauca coffee, a washed coffee. And now it shows its, its unique um, notes specifically um, featured through their various citrus um, qualities. And the florality was, you know, more reminding now of an orange blossom and it was sweeter. And so this lighter roast was done um, in 10 minutes, 35 seconds. So this is two minutes slower than we did in the previous cases. But now also the drying phase had more time the Maillard reactions had more time and Maillard reactions are very complex, but they're very important also for the um, sweetness of the coffee. So if you're not allowing sufficient time for Maillard reactions, you can create this astringency and you can, can create a bitter set of notes. And so, um, so this kind of illustrates the key message of, um, today's lecture, which is almost coming at an end. Um, so what are some, um, if, you, if you look at you know, what kind of roasting profile can you specifically look for when you're um, trying to do lighter roasts? One is, you know, I've seen a lot of roasts that they try to do light roasts too fast at very high temperatures, it's very challenging. So maybe reduce your charge temperature a little bit um, significantly reduce your heat leading to the first crack and then follow the same sensory milestones um, as I have tried to display here and allow for a controlled bean development after the first crack. So that's, that's key, right? Uh, and then here you can see how such lighter roasts can be strategized with your Gießen uh, start at a um, lower burner setting, but then increase significantly, but then take your heat back um, on time. Um, 
do not make the mistake to take your heat back uh, right before the first crack, but uh, do this, you know, when your Maillard reactions are already well on their way. And I, another tip that I also can give you, if you want to do successful live roasts, um, do, do this by also looking at your batch weight sufficiently. Um, and this now really gets into you know, how was your machine installed? Um, how much air are you using? So you should remember that in order to do right, light roasts consistently, sometimes you might want to also reduce your batch weight slightly so that you have more opportunity to um, use your burner setting by taking it down sufficiently to slow the roast down. Uh, and before I call this a lecture and I see there's a couple more questions which I will answer. I just want to um, announce that we are at Booth Coffee Campus, very happy to start our live courses again. And here you can see some of the live courses that we um, will teach in our lab in um, California. And we will also announce uh, our ongoing uh, online courses, uh, webinars, courses, uh, of which we have topics also very much focusing on uh, roast profiling. Um, and then, you know, we always love to uh, analyze your samples and give you specific advice as well. And I could see uh, there was a raised hand. Uh, if the person, if there is a question still, uh, about a specific topic that I can take a little bit of time for that. If not, then we will call this a webinar. Um, so, uh, Sergey asked, what coffee was I talking about? This is a Colombian co uh, coffee from Cauca, Colombia. Cauca is a pretty large region and we, and we used a, um, a coffee that was from a uh, from a blend from Caucas, but it's a very distinct, very hard bean coffee. And um, that is very excellent to do this type of um, um, trial for. And my favorite coffee, Sergey, is, um, let me tell you what my favorite coffee was from last week, it was actually from Finca La Cabra in Panama. And it may not be, a surprise, this is a coffee that we actually produced and that we are very happy about because our processing was done perfectly. So I would say, um, please feel free to get in touch. Um, we are um, more than happy to help you. You can go to our website at uh, bootcoffee.com. You can see this here and send us your questions through the um, contacts field and we are pretty quick in getting back to you um, and what I can say is I wish you all a, a great day a great week and a productive week a healthy week and um, talk soon we will have our next webinars will be um, again the end of this month every last Friday of the month typically so that's the last Friday of uh, June I think um, I'm not sure exactly what date it is but it's the last friday of june typically at 9 a.m pacific time thank you very much see you soon and uh, take care bye bye and just to answer your question yes we will uh share this presentation through our website at Booth Coffee as well as uh, through the Gießen website, gießencoffeeroasters.eu. We always post um, the, these presentations and um, you can um, review the recording in a few days and then you can make your uh, screenshot also. All right, bye-bye, bye-bye you all, bye-bye.